You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Danielle Park, editor of the popular blog Juggling Dynamite and president of Venable Park Investment Council Incorporated. Welcome to the show, Danielle. Thanks, Jim. And uh, good luck. You're going through a blizzard uh, back in Ontario and in Vancouver. I don't want to brag, but... It's sunny and 11 degrees. Well, we're doing our hard time now, but we're looking forward to a lovely summer. So I'm, I'm getting excited. I love the spring. <laughs> anyway, uh, the things we have to talk about for sure, you said here's one of the most insane things that you've heard, financial people on television telling people, you know, you should take out a car loan so you can go out and buy stocks. Mm, I know. Yeah. Well, you know, you, you've got to really search for the winner of the dumbest financial advice because there's a there's a very tight competition worldwide if you turn on the usual channels of information that the the stuff that's handed out as you know uh, monetary financial genius and advice is just ridiculous most of the time but this one really caught my eye because it was sort of a new high watermark for the financially insane but yeah so uh, you know we've talked about in the past Jim all this extending of car loans and Making them zero pay, zero interest, and then getting them to seven years, and so the the dis, and then recently it was don't pay for the first six months, like anything and everything to keep trying to pump cars into a bankrupted society that has no money to buy them with and very poor wage growth to pay, and everything's about you know don't worry it's only two hundred bucks a month or whatever they come up with to make it sound super easy. The problem is that people are, you know, they can maybe make the minimum payments or in this really low rate environment, they can do the interest payments monthly, but they can't pay back the principal. And that's the key. When asset values are too expensive versus a person's actual disposable income, it means that they get very little progress made on paying back the principal sum. And that ties in exactly to the price you pay for the asset, right? So if you're buying, as an example, a house, even if interest rates are at 2.6 on a five-year term like you can get today, it's one thing to say you can make those interest payments. It's entirely another thing to say that you'll be able to have enough in uh, your you know, income or cash flow monthly to make significant headway on that principal sum. It takes you, you know, it, typically people would spend 25 years paying back those type of loans, and now it, they, they're going to need much longer than that. So when you look at the car stuff, it just struck me as so absolutely backwards that we've got these um, fools on CNBC talking about and their their moniker is financial advisor which makes them not just foolish but dangerous and they're telling people that if you've got cash why put it down on your car interest rates are so low that you could just get this loan with next to nothing down and um, you know sure it's a depreciating asset but over seven years if you take that cash and plop it into the stock market surely you're going to you know, have a, you're going to be able to make more than the car loan interest rate, which in this case, they were talking about car loans in the three to four percent range. They said, well, you certainly, you know, if you bought some stocks, you could have a very good chance of outrunning that and making a handsome profit while you've levered up your depreciating assets. So anyway, it's just an example of we're living in this really bizarre time where everything's got so distorted and deformed by all the central bank intervention and goosing asset prices, you know, Look at Vancouver there, Jim. We were just saying how, you know, over the past few years, you're, you're talking about whether you, um, the, the new government, the government has a balanced budget coming in and you're saying, but the debt keeps going up. Well, it's because everyone's pretending and extending, right? They've cut taxes and cut, um, given all these incentives to high net worth people to come into certain areas, primarily so that they can keep the flow of money coming into asset values, house values, which has pumped them up to these ridiculous values that make them unaffordable for the average person. And in that doing so, they have um, given up certain revenue as an incentive to get businesses and high net worth individuals into certain areas. So what we've got out of that is this destructive circle of asset bubbles that no one can afford that have great price risk to capital already invested and a deficit in terms of revenue coming into spending plans. So it's not, it's, we gotta stop looking at these asset bubbles as the way to fix these problems and go back to saving more and spending less. 
and you know that's going to be the way out of this mess but it, it's and the the more they push interest rates lower on the savings side the longer that's going to take us to build back up our savings and you know if you look at the gas savings that people are having i find it interesting um survey after survey says what are you going to do with that extra dollars in your pocket now that you know energy prices have come down and um, you know, 60% of the time and more, it's I'm going to pay down debts. I'm going to try and, you know, uh, have a little more for extra bills. Not I'm going to go out and consume more. I'm going to try and just not go into debt as much is basically the answer. Of course, in Europe, they have negative interest rates because they say they don't want people to, quote, hoard money. Yeah, because that's otherwise known as saving, right? So here we, this goes back to what a crazy financial community we have found ourselves following in the last few years, where, you know, um, hoarding money, otherwise known as saving and fiscal conservatism, is now considered an undesirable. You know, we have to shake the money out of people. We have to give them negative interest rates to have disincentive to save. But, you know, in other periods of great crisis in history, We've had things called custody or safekeeping, safekeeping fees. And I think that's the new mentality. It's that for those of us with capital to lose, um, you, you know, literally instead of looking at how you can make that, you know, big, big gains by taking on big risk and hoping for the best, you know, that, that proverbial casino in the sky that everyone's trying to entice us to play with, people are saying, listen, I just want to make sure that this savings that I've already been able to amass doesn't vanish and evaporate. So if it means that I have to pay a safekeeping fee to keep it safe and liquid, so be it. You know, and what's interesting is people have been doing that with gold and silver and palladium and some of these precious metals for the past many years, right? If you want to buy that as a store of value in the hard bullion form, you pay a fee for that storage, right? So it has a net um, negative cash flow to hold the asset. And people do it because they see it as a store of value that at least, you know, is kind of out of the the, um, fiat currency system. So I'm saying for cash, I think this is the new mentality as well, which is, fine, there's so many crazy policies going on, there's so many asset bubbles in the world today, that it's worth something if you can at least keep your liquid money uh, out of harm's way and have it available for when all of this truth gets out, which means that prices will have to come down significantly. And, you know, very few people will be avail- will be able to take advantage of that, but the goal right now is to be one of them. <laughs> Well, uh, we talk about falling oil prices. Now they've gone up 10% at the uh, oil patch. But in Vancouver, we're paying a dollar thirty a liter for gasoline that just a few weeks ago was selling for 99 cents. The excuse we're given is that 20% of the U.S. Uh, refinery workers are locked out and they had a refinery explosion and fire in California. And by the way, every spring, check the news uh, records. Every spring, there's always an explosion and fire at some refinery in North America, and they always use that as a reason to hike prices just before the driving season opens. Uh, What are you paying there in Ontario? Yeah, well, I was just checking the local gas price here is around $1.08 a a, a liter, so we're a bit cheaper than that. And sure, they'd have to make the argument on the refinery side because the uh, inventory side, Jim, is record off the charts gushing from every orifice it's just like the production numbers just keep going up even as they shutter some rigs you know nowadays they used to have a much more one-to-one ratio of a rig that was pumping to a well that was producing and now they've literally been able to hook up many wells to a rig so they don't need as many rigs anymore to produce you know, as much or more oil. And um, so you, you just see every every week the data comes out and the inventory build is greater. They're literally running out of places to put it. I had that article on this morning. Oh, it's, consumers in Vancouver can tell them where to put it. <laughs> the, uh, you know, the, all the, the, the big pipeline hub in Oklahoma the, at Cushing is uh, two-thirds full already. So it's literally all the floating tankers that can be rented have already been rented. There's a shortage now of capacity in places to store this stuff. And yet the dash for cash flow, and we talked about this before, because when people are he- highly levered, when corporations are up to their 
neck in debt, which they are today because of the free, you know, this great distortion, these free interest rates, not only was it incenting consumers to spend their brains out, but it, and it, and harming savers with little, um, reward on their cash, but it also was incenting corporations who couldn't figure out ways to legitimately grow their business model in a lot of cases, because you're in a falling demand world, you got too much supply of everything, it's not easy to to grow your top line in that kind of an environment. So companies were just borrowing a bunch of cheap credit because they could, because rates were so low, and then using it to do things like buy back their own shares or, you know, just sort of um, invest in building out systems and technology, which at the moment is not actually needed because there's so much more supply than than is necessary. So it's it's um it's just everywhere you look right now you see the mess that monetary madness has made and um you know yields are uh incredibly low not just on the fixed income side but also on the stock side because prices have gone up so much they're the most incredibly valued than that they've been since the 29 peak in the few short months in 1999 before everything collapsed and you know if you look at the um dividend yield on equities today it gives you a sense of where we're at um the they're at historic lows which means you're being paid next to nothing for taking on the risk to your capital in the hopes that things will go higher, that you'll find, you know, another greater fool to buy it off you at an even more elevated price going forward because the income stream that's coming off of most equities is just not worth the risk. So as a point of reference, at the Dow's peak in 1929, which is back where we are, similar valuations today as we were then, you would receive uh, dividends or cash flow of about 5% on Dow, on the large multinational companies that were trading in the U.S. at that point. Um, today, the yield on that is much lower. It's about 3%, right? But two years after that peak of stock values when yields were so low, um, of course, the stock market collapsed and yields were now more than 10%. And the same thing happened when you saw um, in, in the next business cycle, 1935, the Dow yielded a, about 3% at the peak, about where it is today in terms of cash flow because people were overpaying again. And then you saw this uh, huge um, collapse in the stock market again and the dividend increased 130% uh, to about 7.2%. Two percent. So the, the incentive of not buying bubble pricing on things is not just because it uh, keeps your powder dry for better opportunities that come along, but also because you're going to get a doubling and a tripling of available income once you allow prices to come back down. And you know, it's just everywhere we look. It's in the real. It's in the real estate market as well. And there's still all these crazy bidding wars going on all over Canada because interest rates have come off so much but when you do the math today it's just um it's crazy the, the uh you know to get to get your average house price um you know just just here's an example the average house price in Canada today is 420,000 the average uh, income per household is about 75,000 so if people are buying these houses at 10% down they're having to get a $378,000 mortgage even at 2.69, which is this really low rate for five years on a conventional 25-year amortization. The monthly payment on that is 36% on a debt-to-income ratio. That's just making, you know, the bare minimum payment that covers bare minimum principal and the very low interest rate, you know, and taking that on over the next 25 years, which is the longest you can stretch out that kind of a, of a debt, a mortgage, um, you're already at what banks consider to be the sort of threshold, no more debt to income is possible after that. And that's without anyone having a credit card, without anyone having a car loan, a student loan, a line of credit, anything else. So it just really shows you that we're maxed out everywhere you look in terms of buying capacity and spending capacity. And that's why I believe that even you get a drop in, and I think oil prices and gas prices may well go down significantly further from here because, again, as I say, the the supply is so overwhelming, the demand, and I think we're already in the midst of a major global downturn again, and that's going to just continue over the next couple of quarters. But even with the savings in that key commodity, people are so 
uh, scrambling just to cover their basic necessities and with the cash flow available to them that, you know, they're not going to be able to goose spending elsewhere. And when we saw the challenger um, numbers out of the U.S. today, the February challenger jobs report, it really confirmed all of what that and what what we've been saying for the past while, which is that, you know, they had more job cuts than expected. I don't know who was not expecting job cuts or clearly in a world of their own dreaming because we know that the energy sector has been laying people off and that there's knock-on effects to other service sectors that are hit by that. Now, some, you know, dreamers were saying that the retail sector would be a benefactor because people would be spending all that extra, quote, cash flow uh, at the mall and that retail would see a boom and that they would, you know, jobs that were lost in oil and gas would be picked up in the retail sector. Now, oil and gas tends to be the highest paying jobs. Retail tends to be the lowest paying jobs. But people thought this would be a positive for the overall economy. In fact, of course, that is not what's happening. They, they said, you know, falling oil prices have been responsible for um, over 100,000 job losses um, year to date, um, more, more uh, announced layoffs that are coming, and they're not seeing a pickup in terms of higher retail spending. So it's, it's a lose-lose right now in terms of the overall economy and the momentum. Um, and you're seeing that all over. I mean, China as well, you know, this morning lowered their, their growth target to 7% going forward. Um, and they're having a major implosion in their asset markets in terms of their housing markets coming down. You know, they've got so much debt in their system. Um, so I don't know. We, we, we ought to be at the end of this foolish phase where people thought more debt could solve debt problems because the evidence is so thick and furious every day now that it's harder and harder and harder to ignore. We'll have more with Danielle Park right after this. More and more people are looking to the Internet for intelligent, riveting, and thought-provoking interviews. To advertise on the Goddard Report and TalkDigitalNetwork.com, call 604-699-8600, 604-699-8600. Welcome back. We're speaking to Danielle Park, editor of the popular blog Juggling Dynamite. Not only has uh, China seen a slowdown, but in Europe, we've seen the Greek bailout be rescued once again. But you were saying in your blog, this bailout has nothing to do to saving Greece. It's actually saving the French and German banks. Well, this whole thing, right? This whole past eight years, everything that the world has been through, the, you know, 57 trillion more that's been added to the banking system, all of that was under the auspices of stimulating growth, but in fact all about rescuing over-levered banks that had made bad investments and didn't want to have to absorb their own losses. And this is where the mess has come, you know. So it was interesting because that particular clip I put on was the IMF director, um, uh, Paolo Batista, who's, he's one of the executive directors of the IMF, and he was being interviewed by a, a Greek um, TV station on Tuesday, and he just acknowledges that full on in English. <laughs> he says, "Listen, uh, you know, we gave all this money to save German and French banks. It wasn't, in fact, to save Greek people. Um, we didn't want the the banks to take their losses, and so capital was diverted from everything else in the society towards, you know, reshoring or or capitalizing." these great mammoth investment banks who went on to take, you know, crazy risk again, um, broke every law in the book, wasted a whole bunch of, uh, quote, good money after bad, where a few people extracted it out of the system like crazy and became uber wealthy, and everybody else was left with IOUs in the drawer. And he says in that that he thinks now it's time to admit and to say to, you know, the current managing director of the IMF, as an example, Miss Lagarde, and say it's time to stop doing it that way. I mean, you can't keep, you know, protecting this one cohort at the expense of everybody else and expect any kind of meaningful recovery. And so I thought that was refreshing to hear, you know, a bank official because, Mostly, you don't hear that kind of admission yet. You hear, because the, the people at the helm are the Janet Yellens, who was the, you know, a key orchestrator in the mess of the, trying to bail out the banks in 2008 alongside of Mr. Bernanke. Then you had, you know, uh, Mario Draghi is, is the ECB head, and he was again one of the key orchestrators of the mess we're in, you know, came from the investment banking side. So until these people are, 
out of the seat. And, you know, I think crisis is the thing that dethrones them the next time because uh, their theories have been tried and they've come to such a poor outcome and such a devastating cost that uh, the appetite for listening to them further has to be finite at, at some point here. And I think that the, the rapidity of the decline that's going on in the world right now, um, you know, I think things like copper are going to continue to fall and interest rates have gone negative. And this is a problem, right, because so many of the key countries in the Eurozone have negative interest rates now on their bonds, and this new QE program out of the ECB is saying they're not allowed to buy negative yielding bonds, which means that there's very little supply for them to do this QE with to make any kind of meaningful impact in terms of liquidity into the system. They have very little inventory to recirculate at this point that even has a positive yield on it. So the impacts, I think, of the European QE, although widely anticipated in the financial crowd the last couple of months, is going to be very muted at best. Um, and we see how little impact these interventions have had even in places like China and in places like the U.S. where they had so much more inventory to work with and yet they've still exhausted the multiplier effect. You know, they still are getting almost no bang for the buck in terms of growth and demand in the economy for extra liquidity that's just piling up and piling up and piling up. So uh, I think we've come very to the end game here and it's been a very long time coming it's gone on much longer than sane minds would have would have estimated but at the same time you know all the stuff that we thought would likely be the outcome of these policies is in fact coming into fruition so if there's some um encouragement i would say that you know it isn't us that's crazy crazy policies are slowly being revealed and i think logic and reason will have to take over again here uh well, when it comes to logic and reason, the Canadian Taxpayers uh, Federation or Association doesn't believe that uh, TransLink, the, the transportation authority in the greater Vancouver area, has uh, much logic. They've just received a Lifetime Teddy Award from the Canadian Taxpayers Association for a lifetime achievement of wasting money. Uh, they cite 90 examples of TransLink wasting money, and, and the one that sticks in the craw, I think, of a lot of people, is that they have two CEOs now, not just one, but two who together make nearly a million dollars, two bosses. Meanwhile, uh, they're holding a referendum on March 16th to May 29th asking people if they th want to pay an extra half a percent more on the provincial sales tax to fund future transit projects. How do you convince people to vote yes when you have two guys who together suck a million dollars out of the system? And you see, this is the same trend we've seen in financial institutions and large corporations. They uh, tout their large budgets um, as grounds for large bonuses, right? As a typically, these things work as a percentage of your budget is what you look uh, to your compensation. Executive compensation is typically tied to the value of, you know, the market value of the enterprise or the sales numbers and that sort of thing. And so the leverage that has gone into the system has disproportionately rewarded those people. And typically they've got that leverage up by taking on tons of debt, expanding, taking on big departments so that they have a higher budget or need for expenditures. And then, you know, if they're linked to a government, that just is an excuse to have a funnel of money coming into your um, you know, your office or your department. And it's, it, you know, I think we used the analogy once before. It's like blood flow to a cancer cell. If there's a ton of capital flowing in, it's just naturally going to grow. And then it has this sort of a self-fulfilling uh, weight of its own. So I think, you know, in this next phase, when the zeros come out, when the leverage comes off, when the prices shrink, it's happening in the oil sector right now, all of a sudden everything is revealed as no longer affordable in the ways that it was run before and fat gets cut because the workers have taken a lot of the hit in the last few years, but the executives have really been the ones who have held on to most of the positive wage gains and wealth effect. You know, the, the high net worth people saving has doubled in value while the working people have been basically just totally emaciated, um, both through bad choices of themselves and not being, you know, uh, conservative and responsible in their spending, but also just in having no wage gains and buying the, the nonsense from the financial advising community that tells them all these self-destructive things and they think that that's what you do, you know, to get ahead financially. So, it's been a, it's been quite a perfect mess, but I think that, you know, they'll have to 
cut the fat. I think a lot of these CEOs will not get um, the uh, executive packages. They won't be affordable in this new chapter, and uh, that'll be a very positive thing. Um, you know, at some point, truth has to has to come out and balance has to come back, and uh, I think we're in that process now. Well, uh, when it comes to sheer numbers, uh, these two CEOs uh, both make more than the head of the New York Transit Authority, and that's the busiest transit system in the world. Yeah. Well, you've also had the um, the capture of many boards who are supposed to be the voice of reason to, you know, keep some kind of a collar on executive aspirations in many of these institutions. You've had the boards complacent and complicit, really, in... Um, in the compensation schemes. So, you know, I, someone was saying to me the other day, a friend of mine, he's an engineer, now retired, and he said, you know, what amazes him is how little people comprehend conflict of interest. And conflict of interest is a natural phenomenon reoccurring throughout time. But there are different periods in history when people recognize there's a conflict of interest and set up barriers around it so that you can have a half decently functioning you know objective standard about something and and there's supposed to be arm's length between certain actors in the society and, and in business and in government and in the last 30 years they've really taken away all those Chinese walls and protections and thought that we could all be kind of thrown into a pot and you know conflicts of interest wouldn't be a problem well they've eaten the system ragged really and that's that's part of the problem so again we've got to go back to you know not having the cozy clubs of everyone you know scratching each other's back and much more driven by budget then you know if you i think the key too is to compensate link compensation to debt to the quality of the bonds to the the credit rating of the entity rather than to the quote growth of the revenue or profits or you know stock value that's a very interesting concept and uh I think we'll die holding our breaths, waiting for it. No, I think it's coming. I'm very optimistic, Jim. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I hope you're right and I'm wrong. My guest has been Danielle Park. Thank you very much for being with us. My pleasure. Her website, Juggling Dynamite. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio. Find us on Twitter at Talk Digital Net or check out our YouTube channel, Talk Digital Network. Comments about the show can be sent to info at HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. Comments made on HowStreet.com radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com, HowStreet.com radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.